we, all of us as health professionals, I imagine if we took a study or did a study, the, the percentage of the, uh, the greatest generation, not the greatest generation, but the baby boomers, you know, that they're, they're becoming a large part of the patients you see day to day. And as you age, you know, you're unfortunately, as I tell people, it's just a matter of time before you're gonna see me, um, which I guess is a good thing. I mean, that means you're, you're staying active, but you know, unfortunately you've been injured or you've done so, some sort of overuse uh, situation. But good news is in 2017, there's a lot of things we can do to get you back out there. So we'll just, every time I give this talk, I always go over the anatomy, we'll do it quickly, but I think it's important to understand, I think what the take home message about this is that not all shoulder pain is arthritis. I can't tell you how often I have a patient come into the office and say, yeah, doc, you know, my primary care doctor got some x-rays and he said it's arthritis. Well, arthritis accounts for three to 5% of shoulder diagnoses. So there's a take home message all of you can take home too and say, well, it might not be arthritis. There's a lot of other things it can be. So uh, just pointing out uh, that's your coracoid. That's not very often a source of pain, but an interesting structure. There's the joint, there's your glenohumeral joint that will be a, a, a zone for arthritis, but not always arthritis. There's your bicipital groove, bicipital tendonitis, right? There's your greater tuberosity, that's where part of one of your rotator cuff muscles lives. And I think that's interesting. You look at the, the location of the greater tuberosity in the bicipital groove, and I try to describe this to patients too, and, and I think therapists, you guys struggle with this as well as I do, that anatomically they're right next to one another. So oftentimes I will tell patients that one can masquerade as the other and vice versa. And so I think that that's the challenging part. The good part is, is that the treatment we provide short of surgery is essentially the same for both diagnoses. There's your lesser tuberosity, and there's an overlay of your rotator cuff muscles. So we'll go over shoulder arthritis here uh, in a somewhat uh, quick fashion, just again to kind of give you an update. But again, here's a normal shoulder. There's an arthritic shoulder. You don't need to be a doctor to see the difference uh, between those two x-rays, and certainly the pain that can be generated when you've lost that cartilage. A quick review of the non-surgical treatments. Again, I know that we all know this, but I think it's, it's a good idea to just kind of reinforce it because patients ask all the time. Um, and from my perspective, not a lot has changed in the last five to seven years in terms of non-surgical uh, medicinal or what I call sometimes chemical uh, treatments that are non-operative. We all know about uh, the NSAIDs, uh, excuse me, the NSAIDs, injections, physical therapy and those all still remain a mainstay of treatment. There has been a shift in the knee and never really got, held on, got caught on in the shoulder, but the Synvisc injections are hyaluronic acid were for a time being tested in the shoulder. Uh, and I actually took the slide off because there's no study actually that shows it helps in the shoulder. So that's not really an option anymore that I'd, I don't even discuss it with my patients. Uh, at this point, because it doesn't work. Then I put this one up here just because I think you probably get this question too, not as much as you have in the past, because I think it kind of, it's one of those fads of those, you know, the, the non-FDA uh, treatments that the glucosamine congruent sulfate, uh, it's still available. Uh, I still get a couple questions a week, but there, about five to seven years ago, there were a couple good papers that showed there was no difference between glucosamine and a placebo pill. So I tell patients it's not gonna hurt you, but it's probably a waste of money. So as we move on to the surgical treatment of shoulder arthritis, this is probably if you had to kind of show the archetype of what a standard shoulder replacement looked like, this is it, okay? So you've got the stem here that goes down into the humerus. We've got the ball that kind of snaps onto the top and then on the glenoid side or the socket side, you either have in this, company, Lima, that I, I use a fair amount, has a metal base plate, which is, is somewhat rare. Not a lot of companies uh, use that. And then the polyethylene snaps into that. And we know this works well. We have good 15 to 20 year data that tells us at 15 years, 87% of patients can expect to have the same implant in and not had any revision surgery up to that point. So those, those outcomes are pretty good. 
We've actually had studies as well when they look at improvements in quality of life from a shoulder replacement to a hip replacement and a shoulder replacement to a knee replacement. And shoulder replacements always do as good or better, actually. And that's something that I don't think a lot of people know or are aware of. So kind of the update part of the shoulder arthritis, I have two different implants here. Now this is the one I just showed you uh, in a graphic form. Now this is an x-ray of that same implant. And then obviously this is a very different implant. This is what we'd call a stemless implant, okay? For obvious reasons, there's no stem. So this has really caught on, I would say, in the last five to seven years in the United States. It's been used in Europe uh, for a long time, probably 20 years. And in the United States, this is one of the, even the, I would say just in the last two years, I've been involved with this company on the design side of this implant. And I'll show you in a second some subtle differences that I think make this one potentially even better than the, 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 gold, the old standard, if you will. So I think in, in general what's happening is there's been a shift to go away from the stem designs because the bottom line is you don't need it. Okay, we used to think a lot of, almost 90% of what we did in the shoulder or have done in the shoulder in terms of arthroplasty was predicated on all the data in the hip. And there's such a dearth of data there that we said, okay, well it worked in the hip, it's gotta work in the shoulder. Well it does, but as we continue to evolve and continue to do research, the forces across the shoulder are different, the, the, the time used, and, and for many other reasons, um, we're finding that it's probably not necessary. And so here's a, a design, this is a French company design, and this is again the one that I've been working on. And in general, they, do, they accomplish the same goal, but I would submit to you that this one probably recreates the normal contour of the shoulder better. If you had to pick one, granted I'm a little biased, but um, what I would also tell you, and I'm gonna show you on the next slide here, to prepare this humeral head and this humeral head is very different, okay? We're always about preserving as much bone stock as you can because you never know what's gonna come down the line. I had a mentor once that compared ortho orthopedic surgery to pool where you're always trying to set up your next shot. Well, it's, you know, there's no analogy that's great, but I, I think it's reasonable in that you want to be prepared, okay? Um, and this may, may provide some uh, value in this revision setting and that we're not taking as much bone off, so when we go back the second time or the third time that we have more to work with. And so this hopefully gives you a sense of what I'm trying to describe here. So this is kind of your classic approach to literally cutting the humeral head off. That's what we do in probably 90% of our shoulder replacements today. And that's been done that way for the last 60 years. Again, we go back to the hip. And a lot of what we do, again, was predicated on the hip. So we did a pretty good job of creating a sphere. It's, you know, engineering-wise, it's not that hard to create a fixed diameter and a fixed radius of curvature. That, that's pretty easy to do. And so that's what we've had for the last 60 years. And this just represents kind of the Cro-Magnon way that we go about sizing these things as we just take a caliper of sorts around what we cut off. And it's based here, this diagram shows a circle recreating the humeral head. But the thing is, the humerus, the humeral head's not a circle, okay? This, this one here represents the humerus like this, okay? This, just so you get the interpretation now, the perspective is like this, okay? And if you look at that, and you look at the diameter in the superior inferior plane versus the anterior posterior plane, they're vastly different, okay? So you can see that by measuring just one plane, we really are not doing everything we can to recreate a patient's anatomy. And so inherently we think that probably has implications on people's outcomes and perhaps the longevity uh, of the implants that we're using now. So having said that, without getting into too much detail, this is a sawbone representation of what the humeral head looks like after preparing with the, let's say, less invasive implant that I've talked about. 
versus the traditional again. And you can see here, with the more traditional one, you'd, the bone cut would be right about here. And you'd lose all of this bone. Okay? So by taking less bone, you're, you're maintaining their normal anatomy, and then you're protecting that area with the metal head. So here's, again, the final picture of, of this head here. It's less invasive. Again, we think there's decreased pain and quicker recovery. This is all from the journals of anecdotal medicine, okay? There's, there's, there's no data out there yet. But I will tell you, this is a patient of mine, and for the physical therapists, I think this will really hit home with you if I can get it started. It really did start. Here we go. So this patient's five weeks out, okay? Just so you know, usually my patients are in a sling for six weeks, okay? They start therapy as soon as they, they can, we can get them to therapy, but most of them come back with the sling and they're like, it's like they're binky. They're like, don't, don't, don't take away my sling, please. You know, there, there, there's a lot of apprehension and, and, and understandably so. There's, you know, there's a lot going on with therapy and, and the pain after surgery. So this patient, again, has this replacement and is five weeks out. He's not even six weeks out. So trust me when I tell you, and he brought his arms up actively by himself to about 150 degrees. And in 15 years of practice, I've never had a patient come in after a total shoulder able to do this. So for me, that was kind of a sentinel moment. And I said, okay, there's, there's got to be something to this. And so again, I think it goes back to there's a smaller incision. We don't have to do as much uh, exposure to get there. And then, I think the big part is actually, you don't have to prepare this shaft of your humerus. That's gotta hurt, right? You're cutting off more bone, you're sending these reamers down the shaft of a, a large bone. So, uh, I think there's, there's the potential here for really to, to be a game changer. Oh, this is another uh, patient of mine. And I show her every year, and if you've been here before, you'll probably know the answer to this question, but does anybody know which side she had the shoulder replacement on? Left, right, oh, it's a trick question. Both, <laughs> so, all right. So, now onto the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Dr. Oliver uh, touched on that briefly. And again, this really has kind of revolutionized our treatment uh, in shoulder arthritis, and more specifically, what we call cuff tear arthropathy. That's what this implant was designed for in, uh, in Europe in the 80s, okay? So when it came over about 10 years ago, that was really the only diagnosis we used it for, is cuff tear arthropathy. And again, what's that? So it, it broken down to its simple, simplest parts, it's shoulder arthritis with little or no functioning rotator cuff, okay? And so th by doing this reversal of anatomy, what it does is biomechanically enhances the function of the remaining muscles, namely usually your teres minor and your deltoid, okay? It mechanically makes them stronger, and then it stabilizes the joint, because what happens with a traditional shoulder replacement, which we did in the 80s for these patients, and they failed miserably, because what happened, the normal kinematics of your shoulder when the rotator cuff's working is that it's compressed, right? And the, the ball stays centered. Without any rotator cuff, you piss them up and down like this. It's very inefficient and frankly painful. That's why they come. So by replacing it with a standard shoulder replacement, this pistoning didn't stop, and this wore out on average between two to three years after the surgery. So it failed miserably. So by reversing this, you now have what we call captured kinematics. So now the shoulder still wants to piston, but because of the design of the implant and changing the mechanics, it's now obligated to rotate around this. Okay, so it solved two problems. It gets rid of the arthritis and it enhances people's function dramatically. And we now have, the first, just this last fall, we have 10-year data that shows that the 10-year uh, recovery on this is 88%. So again, I gave you 15-year 87% for total shoulders, anatomics, for reverses, 10-year data is at 88%. So that's pretty good. Again, this just shows now that what happens with a reverse. And I talked here, cuff tear arthropathy was the initial reason, the initial indication, and now that's expanded. Proximal humerus fractures are probably 
equal to, if not surpassed, the diagnosis for cuff tear arthropathy in terms of the indication. We know that they generally do better than if we try a total and anatomic shoulder. Malunion, nonunion is not as common, but certainly are applicable there. And in massive irreparable cuff tears, those patients used to be an, a, a very challenging problem because we don't have a good solution beyond a reconstruction like this. There are some um, allograft patches used that don't work. Um, you can do a latissimus transfer. There's actually a lower trapezius transfer that we can do. But those are, those are for your patients that are under 50 and still working. So it has a, that's a very small, narrow indication. So patients 60 and over, a reverse shoulder arthroplasty has actually been, st really in the last four to five years, we've started to use it. And is almost, I would say, 90% of that market or that net niche now. So on the PT side of things, this is a new slide, because it used to be just universal, six weeks sling and no PT. So just this last fall at, at our, the annual shoulder and elbow meeting, I took kind of like a straw poll, and it went, was anywhere from two weeks to eight weeks, but I would tell you that probably on average, it's like three to four weeks now with a sling. And a directed either home or limited office PT starts at about three to four weeks. Okay, we're getting them, we're moving them a lot quicker. And I think, the, why did that change? I think it's just a product of the anxiety and apprehension around a new technology that you didn't know, and now we know you can get them moving quicker. We'll touch quickly on the rotator cuff repairs. Uh, not a lot has changed in terms of our arthroscopic approach and how we fix it, when we fix it, and the, the therapy. Um, this is just a quick little diagram or a graphic MRI representation. Humeral head, top of the supraspinatus, bottom of the supraspinatus, that is the gap of a tear. So that you're looking at a rotator cuff tear there. The next topic, again, just one slide, but I get a lot of questions on biologics in orthopedics now. And there's a fair amount in the shoulder because there's a prominent shoulder and elbow surgeon at the University of Connecticut that's doing a lot of stem cell work taking stem cells just out of your, your humeral head or your hip, and that's great. I think it's got great potential, but there is zero data on it. But there, there are people out there, and I see it every week in the, the Duxbury Clipper, that it's, it's an all-cash business, but if you pay the money, you can get your stem cells pulled out and put anywhere in your body. They'll do it. But again, I think I, I caution you to, to, to be data-driven in the decisions you make. Uh, PRP, platelet-rich plasma, that has a little more data, but it's got more bad data, really. They're, they're poorly designed studies. Um, the ones that are, that have more power, actually show that they do nothing. Some of the lesser power studies suggest they might help. Um, but again, uh, I don't use it in our practice. I don't, nobody in our practice actually does this routinely, I don't believe. Um, there may be some palliative effects in some of the tendinopathies, uh, tennis elbow. Uh, golfer's elbow, but again, really limited data here. And then allograph augmentation, that's basically, this is an example of a patch that's only been out for about the last year, 18 months. I did a handful of these um, just to kind of see what this was about. And the, the company would tell you that there are these bioregenerative properties within this allograph dermal tissue that help facilitate tendon growth. How much data is out there on that? Zero. The, the reason that I think this has potential and a limited use is perhaps in somebody that's had a rotator cuff surgery already and they failed and so you're going back. And this may, may help keep the bone marrow that it comes out or seeps out after you've made holes for your, your anchors. It may hold those stem cells in close approximation to the tendon. That's really the only thing in theory that we think it, it may do. But this is another one you might hear about. This is just an update. I presented this a couple years ago. I was uh, with some of the, the first trials uh, in the United States with this. This is an all arthroscopic transosseous tunnel maker, basically. And long and short of it, basically you can arthroscopically put tunnels in the greater tuberosity where the, the rotator cuff should be without using anchors. Okay, so in some studies that's actually biomechanically superior to anchors. And number two, 
there's value in it, and it's because it's cheaper. And that's going to actually be released uh, in the first quarter of next year. Now we'll go on to falls and fractures. Um, I just like amusing pictures of people hurting themselves. Um, but uh, and skateboarding, that's another good one. So as it pertains to the shoulder, I'll give you a, a, a one slide history of the, the treatment around surgical fractures or, or you know, operative fractures around the, the proximal humerus. We used to do all sutures before we had implants. Then we used these little metal rods that looked like old knitting needles that you would drive down the center of the bone in hopes of trying to create some stability. Then, and probably I would say, you would say is current, are these here. These are these pre-contoured plates that match the anatomy of the proximal humerus, and they have locking screws in them. So these screws, while they screw in to the bone, they also have threads in the head, so they become almost a part of the plate. And so they're much, biomechanically speaking, they're much stronger. And so this did help. This was a big leap in our treatment of proximal humerus fractures. However, they're not perfect. So this is, let's say, immediately post, well, not quite immediately, a little bone here. But this shows how this fracture is actually falling. If you can see, it's kind of falling into varus a little bit. So it's still, it's not the panacea, but again, it's better than what we have. And the reason I show you this slide is that this is one of my patients that I saw in my office. And this was a, actually a 36-year-old female on a dirt bike. And she ended up with this implant. And this implant is an intermedullary device. So when we put inside the bone, okay, it's based on cardiac stent technology that they've obviously expanded, literally and figuratively, to be applicable uh, to orthopedics. And what this does, if you think of that last slide where that fracture collapsed, this is providing support inside the bone that you haven't been able to achieve with any other implant out there. It's fundamentally different in how it approaches the, the, the fixation, if you will, of this fracture. So it's still new, we're still uh, developing it, and we now do have a, a plate attachment that uh, looks like the, that previous plate. So it's kind of, might end up almost being like a belt and sus suspenders approach to these fractures in some problematic areas. AC separations or shoulder separations, I thought I'd at least you know, talk about that real quickly. Um, we all see these, you probably see people on the beach every summer that walk around and you know, it's not the prettiest looking thing. Um, but I, it, that's half the time when I see patients like this, this is probably a really bad grade three or really a grade four probably. But I'll tell people, listen, you are never gonna do shoulder modeling again. <laughs> However, you usually don't have pain. And that's the, the, the biggest hurdle, frankly, to get over is that Functionally, there's not usually a difference here, but it's aesthetics, and that's real. I, I mean, I, I, I respect that, you know. Um, when I, if I was 20 and had this injury, I'd want to get surgery. But I'm a aging, balding, middle-aged dad, and it doesn't really <laughs> bother me anymore. So, but to that end, I would say we're, we're doing more surgery on this in 2017 than I was in 2007. Okay, there are some studies, not a lot. It's usually in very high-end athletes that this will affect quarterbacks, pitchers, or any, any major league baseball player. So those people usually get fixed. But usually this is just what we call benign neglect. Clavicle fractures, got to do a quick review of that because that's actually changed fundamentally from the time I started my practice to today. When I started practice, you never, I never say never, never say always, but it was very rare that you operated on a clavicle fracture. Today, we have pretty good indications to when you should operate on a clavicle. And all centers around a Canadian group that did some very good population statistics studies on patients that found that while even if this fracture heals, that functionally they've reset, if you will, the muscle tension length of the shoulder girdle, 
And so that they find that they, you know, it's one of those kind of intangible things. They just say, Doc, you know, this arm gets tired, or I just don't have the strength. And I'm, you, I'm sure you guys see it in your, in your office, too. So it was, it's more based on that. There was also, given these parameters of two centimeters displacement with the comminution, there was a, a slightly higher non-union rate. So there's a, in my mind, that's, that's probably the more applicable reason to do it. But this is a discussion you have with the patient and explain to them the pluses and minuses, obviously. On pediatric patients, it still really hasn't changed much. It has to be pretty catastrophic to, to operate on a, a pediatric patient's clavicle fracture. I will tell you with PT, given the new plate technology that we've had with these pre-contoured stainless steel plates, we move them right away. Um, we do have a sling for two to three weeks, weeks more for comfort. We don't start strengthening until we see some signs of healing. Um, that's usually six to eight weeks, but that's variable. And again, that's, that helps with the dialogue with you guys in terms of helping us understand their, their comfort level and how, the, how they're progressing. Shoulder dislocation, that certainly is an injury. Um, we see a fair amount of this. Traumatic uh, dislocations are the most common uh, type that I see. Very close behind that, however, are the non-traumatic, uh, mostly females, what we call the multi-directional instability patients. I would say 95% of patients that I see for a first-time dislocation get therapy first, unless they're, they're a high-level athlete in between seasons that doesn't want to mess around and they say, okay, give me what, you know, give me the surgery that's going to give me the highest rate to get back with a shoulder like it was before I heard it. Because the data does show us with these traumatic instability patients under the age of 25 for sure, maybe 26, the rate of redislocation is as high as 85, 90%. So oftentimes, I'll tell them we're doing a, gonna do th physical therapy to get you through the season. Maybe you can go back, maybe not, depending on how comfortable you are, but more than likely, I, I tell them you're gonna be back to see me, probably. And the standard of care for anterior instability is either an arthroscopic bank heart repair or an open repair. And I would say there's a little bit of a shift for treatment of this arthroscopically. We kind of got on the bandwagon 10 to 15 years ago on the arthroscopic side of things. And it's generally accepted that the failure rate for arthroscopic repairs is probably, let's say, 12 to 15 percent, whereas an open unidirectional traumatic instability is 5 percent, 6 percent. So there's definitely a difference. Some of it, I think, is, again, patient perception, the cultural aspect of it. But I will tell you, I have this conversation more often today than I did 10 years ago with a football player and tell them, you know, if it was my shoulder, I'd want the open, because I know I've, I've got, you know, two-thirds less likelihood of, of it coming back out again. Now, I mentioned this one. This is not that common, but kind of a cool procedure that we do. The ladder J is a procedure whereby we take a piece of the coracoid, we osteotomize a piece of the coracoid, and move it into the front of the glenoid. We do that, the indication for that is generally if you have more than 15 to 20% bone loss off the anterior glenoid, okay? And so that usually, that's pretty rare for a first time dislocator. We usually see that on persons that come back two, three, five, seven, ten 10 times, they start to wear it out. It can happen acutely for sure, and I do have an example here of that. But this is actually a very reproducible procedure for someone that's started to erode their socket to a degree. So here's an example of that. This is a, a patient of mine uh, a couple of years ago that had probably actually about 25% bone loss. And so this, I didn't even discuss arthroscopic surgery. This went right to the ladder J as soon as I got this CT scan. Um, and he did well. This is a, a post-op picture of him with his screws. And again, right here, so here's his head's up here, hands down here, this is the front of his body. The graft is right here, being held by the screws. Non-traumatic instability, just to go back to that quickly. Uh, again, it's, it's a, probably a three to one preponderance of female over male. Generalized ligamentous laxity is the term we use. We feel that maybe it's, it's linked to, to hormonal levels. We truly, honestly don't know, okay? But they do generally better with therapy than the traumatics long term, okay?
And these patients, if they fail non-operative, their response to arthroscopic surgery is actually better than the, the unidirectional traumatics. So they actually do very well, generally speaking. The challenge with these patients is that because they're gymnasts, because they're swimmers, they're gonna go back to that, and the beating they put on the arm doesn't go away, and they can stretch out again over time. Dislocations of the elbow. I apologize, we're at the very top there. It does say elbow trauma. So uh, dislocations are a very obvious, uh, acute uh, problem. We see not a lot of these. Probably, I see probably uh, 10 to 12 uh, a year, and maybe a third of those need surgery. Most of them are a simple dislocation. Well, what does that mean? Um, there's usually no bony pathology, no fractures, and generally speaking, the ligaments are competent to a degree. Well, what does that mean? Well, what you do is when you're in the ER and you're putting this back into place, that's the perfect time to do an exam under anesthesia. So you range this patient to see where they're unstable, if at all, okay? And depending, if they do have a ligamentous tear, they'll either be unstable in valgus, if it's a medial only collateral ligament problem, or with a varus stress, if it's lateral. Now they also can be, have a combination which is called posterior lateral rotatory instability, which is a one that we probably most commonly operate on because that mechanism is that drives the, the the ulna out the back and laterally. And what it does is it oftentimes fractures this bone, this piece of bone here, the coronoid. But if it's not, you reduce it, short-term immobilization, up to a week, you begin PT by two weeks. That's the key. And that's probably a fundamentally different approach than probably some of the silver foxes in the room here maybe had uh, as it pertains to, to elbow management. We used to lock you up you know, for at least a month, because frankly, the, the elbow was a little bit of a, a black box. They didn't know a lot about the elbow. Elbows really, just in the last 15 to 20 years, we've learned a lot more about the biomechanics of it. But what happened is, yeah, that, that elbow was stable, but it was concrete, too. It, it didn't move. So here's a dislocation with ligamentous injury. Kind of, I just touched on that a second ago in terms of doing the exam under anesthesia. Sometimes, even if it's unstable, but you have a stable arc, okay? Let's say it's unstable past 30. And some of you in the room might have seen some of my scripts where I define what the stable arc is. And if you're within that arc, we still start moving them right away, okay? What I'll also say sometimes is in pronation. And the reason I say that is that in posterior lateral rotatory instability, when you bring the forearm in to pronation, it tightens up your extensor mass on the lateral side of the elbow, and it provides some level of stability. So in those patients that, let's say they were neutral, we allowed them to extend, and they became unstable, let's say, at 60. But if I kept them in pronation, I got another 30 degrees before they demonstrated any instability. And that's, that's a huge difference at day zero if you can start that far ahead of the game. Again, it goes back to, again, we're very aggressive now about moving elbows. This one is a fractured dislocation. And you see this kind of, it looks like cloudy here, a little bit here. This patient we reduced and did have surgery, but no x-rays on that one. This one is another example of a fractured dislocation. And I highlighted here, there's a piece of bone here and then there's also a little fleck here. And sometimes you look at these and you're like, oh, that's a small piece of bone. That's what we used to say. Oh, that's just a little piece. Look at the joint, looks perfect. Well, the problem is, is that these two structures fractured the coronoid, the radial head, and then the disruption of the ligament is what we call the terrible triad, okay? That's the worst player when it comes to elbow trauma. Even with what we know today, they still do the worst. But we still do a lot better than we used to. In this particular patient here, we were able to plate his radial head. You see these holes here? These are drill holes where we took sutures and pulled down that other piece of the coronoid. And here's another one. This one's interesting in that I highlight this because a piece of his radial head 
it started to head down towards his wrist. Uh, so this one, it was a very large man, fell off a of rocks, probably he's almost 300 pounds, and you can just imagine the energy going through that elbow. And this gentleman, we actually had to do a separate incision to get that piece of the radial head. It was so far away from our operative site. This gentleman, we were unable to reconstruct his radial head, so we did a radial head replacement, reconstructed his ligament. This one, this is an elderly female, okay? Again, you don't need to be a doctor to see that that's not right, okay? <laughs> and now, what we know about this special subset of patients is that you can reconstruct this, you can put plates, we've all seen those patients post-operatively, and they do well, but they're stiff. If we do an elbow replacement, these patients, by week two, are drinking their coffee, they're knitting again, they're you know, playing gin rummy, they're, you know, they're back to, to their life, okay? And that's a very important distinction, because this is a small niche of patients here. They have a five pound lifting limit on the, their arm for the rest of their life. So that's pretty restrictive. But I think it's interesting, it's just a neat x-ray, frankly. And then this one here, this is, kind of the, the, the whole kitchen sink here. So she has, this patient has a proximal humerus fracture here and the same fracture of that last patient and she got the bonus package. So <laughs> she has both a proximal humerus RAF and uh, elbow replacement all in the same day. And so I think that the take home message with the elbow, early motion is key, okay? That if you take anything out of this talk about the elbow, early motion is key. You know, I'm gonna go through these very quickly because I'm running short on time, but these are kind of the, the wear and tear overuse things we see that we see a lot of, okay? <laughs> Tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, uh, cubital tunnel, the nerve impingement, that's the funny bone irritation. Again, I'm just highlighting here the medial epicondylitis or golfer's elbow, the ulnar neuritis here along the back side of the medial epicondyle. On the outside, the lateral epicondylitis or the tennis elbow. Radial nerve trapment's pretty rare, but those are probably the two most common. These I probably see once every other year. Actually, this one here, but this one I see a fair amount of. Posterior elbow issues, triceps rupture, again, pretty rare. Chondromalacia is another term for early arthritic changes you can see in the elbow, usually seen in overhead athletes as they get older. Anterior elbow injuries, biceps ruptures we see a fair amount of, actually. We treat those pretty aggressively. I would say if you're under the age of 70 for sure, you're usually getting it fixed from 70 to 80, depends on the lifestyle, over 80, go play chess and you know, have, have your coffee. But take home message about those, again, we've all seen this slide, 95% of the time that's all any of these need, okay? And we've actually had a real paradigm shift in how we treat tennis elbow. Used to be I did a fair amount of surgery for tennis elbow. The evolving theory about tennis elbow is that it's frankly a part of passing through middle age. So from the fourth to sixth decade of life, we are all in this room going to get some form of tennis elbow. It may be a passing week or two, we are like, what the hell is that? It may be up to two years. There are some studies that last two years. But the overriding theme is, you don't need surgery. It will be overcome without surgery. And finally, I have to put a plug in for the arthroplasty group in whole. This is obviously an old slide before Jordan became BI, but this, really holds true. We're usually in the top five, I would say, or lowest five, as it were, for complication rates around shoulder, hip, and knee replacements. Okay, that's an important thing. I, I think that, you know, another take-home message to, to let your patients know as well. Thank you. <laughs>